Uh, let's get this going. Take your seats. So how did the assignments go last week? It's been a week since I saw you. Amazing. Amazing. Get caught up. I'm starting to get some grades in. I'm, I'm perpetually behind on grading a little bit, but I'm trying to at least get up, catch up on some of the grades and then try to, to keep up on the quizzes at least. Uh, so you didn't have a quiz last weekend. You had some other assignments. Uh, how are we feeling about heat capacity, specific heat? Feel like we could do those? Yeah. How about one of those uh, find the final temperature ones? Um, yeah, those are long. Those are a little bit trickier. We're starting off with one, and then we're going to get into quantum. We're going to do a little bit of math today, and then we're going to get into quantum, and it's all going to be conceptual and cool, cool history of history of the Manhattan Project stuff. All right, so give this a couple minutes to try. You've got a sample of copper metal. Heated up to 99.8 degrees Celsius. Then it was put into a beaker containing 80 grams of water at 22.6 degrees Celsius. Assuming the water gained all the heat lost by the copper, what's the final temperature of the water and the copper? For whatever reason, it did not like my degree symbol on a few of these. Those That funky looking U is supposed to be a degree symbol. I don't know what's going on with that. Uh, is this the same one on the last question on the homework? Yeah. Okay. Like, yeah. So you should all know the answers then already, right? Seven point. Oh, good. Did anybody, did anybody struggle with that one? Yeah. Want to work yeah. through it? Yes. Yes, please. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. You can work through it. Yes. You can work through it. All right, we have two things that are happening, right? What two processes are happening right now? The water is gaining energy from the copper, and the copper is losing energy, right? So we've got Q for the copper is equal to mass of copper, specific heat of the copper, delta T for the copper. Then we, we can write the same thing out for the water, right? <clears throat> Mass of water, specific heat of water, delta T for water. We want to know the final temperature. Final temperature is not in these equations. What else? What do we have to do before we can actually? There's a couple key steps that we have to do. One, we need to rewrite this so that it has final temperatures and, and initial temperatures in it. Because we have initial temperatures and we want to find the final temperature so we don't know delta T for either of them, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. So if we rewrite this, we can say specific heat of copper equals mass of copper, Cp of copper. Remember that delta anything is always can always be written as final minus initial. We can do the same thing for water, right? Now we have two equations and two unknowns. We know everything except what? We temperature final. I, actually, we have two equations, but how many unknowns do we have? Two. Not quite. We've got three unknowns right now, right? We've got Q for the water, which we don't know. We And then we know everything else but T final. We don't know Q for the copper either and we don't know T final. So we actually have three unknowns. So we need one more equation before we can start doing substituting, right? What's the last equation? That the Q copper equals what? Exactly. Don't forget that negative sign or you're gonna get something that doesn't make sense. 
you get your final temp, you would get your final temperature of the water is lower than the temperature that the water started as, or that your final temperature is higher than the temperature of the copper. Neither of those is possible, right? But if you did all the algebra without this negative sign here, that's what would happen. You'd get an answer that doesn't make sense. The key aspect of, that separates science from math is we can do what I like to call a reasonableness check. At the end, we don't know what T final is going to be, but we know we can use our everyday experience to know that it should be between 22.6 degrees Celsius and 99.8 Celsius. If nothing else, if we get an answer outside that range, we did something wrong somewhere, right? So always think about that when we're solving these. Does my final answer make sense? If not, if you get an answer that's not physically possible, you either did a bad substitution somewhere, or you missed a negative sign, or you missed a conversion somewhere, or something like that. I think it has to be negative. So it shouldn't really matter, right? Because we could multiply both sides by negative one and we get the opposite mathematically. But you're right, it would probably make more sense to write it like that because the copper is losing. As soon as we have this, then we can actually just ignore Q. We don't actually care about what Q is to answer this question, do we? So we just substitute both of these in here, solve for TF. So we'll get, don't forget the negative sign, mass of copper, CP of copper, T final is what we're solving for, minus T initial of copper equals mass of water. CP of water, T final minus T initial of water. Still looks a little intimidating because we haven't started plugging numbers in, but it's just algebra at this point, right? One, we got everything down to one equation, one unknown. And we wind up with an answer. So the specific heat of copper is about, mm, yeah, so it should be something in the mid 20s for your final answer here. Um, this is the point where you could just plug it into a solver. Once you get here, now you're just one equation, one unknown. You can start doing all your substitutions, plug it into a solver, have the solver do the math for you. All right, questions on how to finish that one up? Somebody who crunched, who crunched all the numbers, what was the final answer? Got, we've got about almost six times, we've got five times as much water and 10 times greater delta C. So yeah, it should be something something in the in the mid to high 20s. Should we do the algebra too? No. Great. All right, if you want to see the algebra stick around after class for a couple minutes and we can finish up just and we and uh, we can work through that and get you the answer. All right. Let's see, so what else did we did? Uh, a little bit of phase change, a little bit of atomic mass too, right? Uh, atomic mass field, we did some practice with weighted averages back when we first learned about Excel, right? So same basic principle, just not with nice clean numbers like 30%. Just stuff like 74% abundance instead of a category weight for a grade, but same basic math, right? All right. Let's let's talk about quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is fun because everybody has this perception of what it's like, um, partly informed by famous scientists saying things like this, um, because it is weird. It doesn't behave the way that our everyday natural intuition about the, the real world 
would tell us things behave. Um, Niels Bohr is one of the founders of it. And Niels Bohr is one of my favorite, favorite uh, physicists um, because, you know, everybody knows Einstein had all the, the, you know, catchy quotes that everybody likes to quote, like God does not play with dice and things like that. Uh, Niels Bohr was, was his friend who, um, who always had the, the answer to Einstein's quippy, quippy quotes. He would say, you know, Einstein would say, God does not play with dice, and Bohr would say things like, Einstein quit telling God what to do. Um, so in, he's fascinating also in that he was probably severely dyslexic. Um, we do know based on records for the time that he was pretty much illiterate. He couldn't read. He had to dictate his thesis to his mom, who typed it for him on a typewriter, because he couldn't read. Um, and yet still rose to be one, a Nobel Prize winning physicist, one of the founders of quantum mechanics. Um, so just goes to show that a, a lot of these um, physicists and scientists that get put up on pedestals, they're still just people too. Uh, I really like this picture too. This is also one of the really interesting times in history. Uh, it was originally taken in black and white. Somebody went back and colorized it. But this is from 19... 1921, I think, uh, the conference at a place called Solve. Um, and one of the things, one of the reasons that the early 20th century is really, really fascinating from a, from a scientific point of view is that this is one of the first times in history where you could actually get all of the, the biggest names, the biggest minds of the time. You could have them physically present in the same place at the same time. Up until about the early 20th century, when when steamboats and railroads and everything became really commonplace, um, you really didn't have a way to do that. People were, were working together on a lot of these early scientific theories by doing by writing letters to each other, or they were working entirely on their own, and so they were limited by the, their own perspective, their own point of view. Or they would write a letter and they would send it off and two months later their friend would get the letter and then they would think about it for a couple months and then they would write back and it would take two months for the letter to get back. So you can see how that would really slow down scientific progress. The invention of the telegraph, the invention of the steam engine and steam, steam ships um, allowed for them to communicate in close to real time. Um, and it was, it was a huge change in the way that scientific progress um, happened. Uh, so this is this picture is from one of those first um, conferences. And it's still mostly all just Americans and, and Northern Europeans at this point. Um, and you'll notice that it's predominantly male, very, very white male dominated, like most of the 20th century. Um, one famous woman, the only one in this picture who won two Nobel Prizes, um, one of only three in history who's won two, who have won two Nobel Prizes, is Marie Curie, um, who is fascinating in her own right. She was sort of the pre-quantum. She really what didn't contribute as much to quantum mechanics as the rest of this picture. Um, but she was sort of the, um, the old guard. She and uh, Lorenz was a mathematician who's sitting right next to her. After Marie Curie's husband died, Lorenz and, and Marie Curie had a on again, off again romance for the rest of their lives. Um, Marie Curie also was, so she, I mentioned she won two Nobel Prizes. So all of those boxes represent Nobel Prizes. The red ones are physics, the green ones are chemistry. The dotted ones mean they didn't want to win a Nobel Prize, but their direct student did. So they're sort of one generation removed from a Nobel Prize. Um, there's a lot of, of star power in this picture. A lot of names you've heard of, um, especially if you saw Oppenheimer. You know, this Oppenheimer is not in this picture, um, but the right next to De Broglie, between De Broglie and Bohr, right there, is Max Born, who act, who is who um, Oppenheimer studied with in Europe. How many of you saw the movie Oppenheimer? About half. So remember, Oppenheimer left the UK, went to go study in Germany with with Born um, at the beginning. And so Oppenheimer's most 
most famous contribution to quantum mechanics, something that doesn't get much recognition for, um, called the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, which winds up being really important when you start looking at um, structures of atoms or structures of uh, molecules and what the actual geometries and shapes of these molecules are that we'll get into in a in a little bit. Um, he's probably the biggest name that's not in this picture from the 20s. And then there are two that were too young to be here, Linus Pauling and Richard Feynman. Feynman had one of those cameo roles in Oppenheimer, and he's one of those scientists that said, like, had like two speaking lines, but wasn't a big enough part of the overall story to get um, much screen time. Um, he became really, really big post-World War II, as did Linus Pauling. Um, who else is on here? Oh, the other one worth pointing out, as long as we're talking about the Manhattan Project. So up here in the back, um, that's Enrico Pauli, and that's uh, Werner Heisenberg. Heisenberg was the one who, who they couldn't really, who kind of bought into the whole National Socialist environment in late 30s in Germany um, and headed up the German, the Nazi version of the Manhattan Project. Um, the highs of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, also really key, key person, um, wound up, wound up in the, on the wrong side of history there to put it light, lightly. Um, and, and I don't know, I, I used to say this before I realized that he was the head of the Nazi program. I've never seen a picture of Heisenberg where he didn't look just kind of creepy. Uh, he always, he's kind of always like hunched forward and like, he's like, peering around a corner. It's just has this, if you ever see a picture of Heisenberg, he always kind of has that look. Um, this one right there, see if it'll let me zoom in on him. Nah, oh, there it goes. Right there. He always has that, that's always his facial expression. Every picture I've ever seen of him. Um, all right. So the other thing that was really cool about this is basically not, they basically got together, they would spend all day presenting their research to each other in these presentations. And then all night they would sit around and eat and drink and argue with each other about what the research meant. Um, they all respected each other enough that they weren't telling each other that they were wrong. They were like really finding holes in their research. They were willing to do that if their research wasn't good, but it was more that they were like, well, that can't, like Einstein was was really known for this. Einstein really didn't like quantum mechanics. He thought it can't possibly be true because he didn't like the implications of it. Um, he in his older age, which is this is towards um, his uh, the end of his life, not towards the end of his life, but towards uh, well past his prime. Um, he had a lot of arguments with people where he didn't have a good answer for why, but he would say things like, you can't be that because I don't like that. That's that his whole God does not play with dice. He just didn't like the implication that things were random. Um, but he didn't have an argument against it. And so these were really important conferences because it allowed them to sort of argue in real time. Schrodinger is another good one. Schrodinger looking dapper with the uh, bow tie in the back. That's Schrodinger of Schrodinger's cat that we'll talk about in a few minutes, um, which came from one of these conferences. It's called the Copenhagen Interpretation. Um, he actually was using Schrodinger's cat was a thought experiment to demonstrate how foolish it is to try to apply quantum mechanics concepts to everyday life. Um, and yet it somehow has outlasted most of the rest of these people's names um, despite the fact it was really a thought exercise in absurdity. All right, so what is it that led to quantum mechanics? Turns out Einstein didn't win his Nobel Prize for E equals MC squared. He published in that in the same year. Einstein and Newton both had a year that they, that's referred to as the Anno Mirabilis or miracle year, um, where they published three really, really important papers um, and had three really, really important discoveries that all happened within one year in their early 20s. Um, Einstein's most important was basically proving 
that that light is a particle or that energy is only transmitted at certain as kind of as a packet of information or the packet of energy that they call the quanta and the one of the ways that they were trying to understand this is they understood in the 1800s they understood that there was some sort of duality between um waves and particles they started to understand de broglie that was standing next to um uh Bohr in the last picture under started to realize that things could be both a particle and a wave at the same time which didn't seem to make sense until you started looking at really 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 small things um and so the way they started to explain that is that small particles, all particles behave like waves as well as particles. And the smaller your particle is, the more it behaves like a wave. And photons were about as small as you could get. Photon, photons didn't have any mass to speak of. Um, and so they, they behaved like a wave that also was a particle. And so one of the ways that we kind of can try to understand this is by treating it, by looking at it as though it's a, um, the vibrations of guitar strings. So this is when we get to do a little, little demo about how harmonics work. Who plays uh, any stringed instruments in here or instruments in general? Who knows what a harmonic is? Wants to give a definition. In everyday words, it doesn't have to be perfect. Yeah. Basically, the same note that's played on like four yeah. Close. It doesn't have to be the same note. But basically, if you have a string vibrating back and forth, picture this is the guitar string. It's going to vibrate with a certain frequency that's going to create the, what we perceive as sound or as pitch. You can take that same string with the same size box. We call this um, type of uh, description, a particle in a box. You can take that same size box and you can actually give it a shorter wavelength by adding a spot in the middle where it doesn't vibrate. And so that that first that first string where you see just up up and down is that that first string this is like striking an open string on the guitar you just see this the string vibrates back and forth and you get a certain frequency from it Without changing the overall length of the string, really what you're doing when you're playing a guitar, by pushing down somewhere here, you're actually changing the wavelength of the, the length of the string. String only acts like it exists from here to here at that point. So without doing that, I can actually change the note just by putting my finger right squarely at halfway between this part of the string or where the string starts and ends. And I didn't really change the length of the string. I just added what's called a node in the middle. That node in the middle basically means there's a point in that string where it's not vibrating. And that changes the overall wavelength without changing the length of the string itself. Now, the amount of energy in one of these waves is related to how curved the wave is. By adding a node in the middle, I make that, that wave more curved. That means it's a higher energy wave and higher, we perceive that as a higher frequency. And I can do that again. You can add a second harmonic. If I put my finger exactly a third of the way, and again, it's still vibrating. The overall string is the same length. I can just fit more waves on it. By adding nodes at different points along the string, we actually cause the string to vibrate at a different energy. If I just tried to put my finger at random on here, 
it just sort of mutes it. Nothing really works. I guess it's amplified enough. You can still hear it vibrate a little bit. But here, I just sort of deadens it. If I try to put a node in a spot that's not an even fraction of the way along the uh, string. So you can do open string. You can do halfway. You can do a third. You can do a quarter without actually pressing down on the sink, without changing the length of the string itself. The fact that I can I can do it at a quarter, a third, a half, but I can't do it at some random amount is kind of the way electrons behave. They can't exist between certain energies. Electrons behave like waves because they're so small that if you tried to put a node right here, say, you just get that deadened vibration. Nothing vibrates. The wave can't exist in that space with a the node there. And so they started seeing the electrons. They knew at this point the electrons had mass. They knew the electrons were particles, but electrons behaved like waves in that they could only <laughs> exist at certain energies. Just like the vibrations on the on the guitar string can only exist at certain energies, certain frequencies. So, um, one of the the first quantum mechanics real discovery was by Max Planck, spelled like Planck, but I got told by my Eastern European grad school instructor that if you ever pronounced that Planck, he was just going to straight fail you. So it's Planck. You had to be very careful with the way you pronounce this in front of, of Josef Mikkel. He was very, very picky about his Eastern European names. Um, Max Planck came up with the idea that you could, you could relate the energy of light, energy of a photon, to a, to a constant times the frequency of that photon. So what's a photon? Light. But how how does this work? Because you could also, what if you just had more intense light of the same frequency? How does, wouldn't that give you more energy? So they really didn't quite understand what this was saying until Einstein came along and, de and demonstrated what's called the work function. In Einstein's Nobel Prize was actually for demonstrating that light exists in discrete packets that they call photons. That basically a photon is a tiny packet of energy that can, that, and the energy contained in that light is based entirely on the frequency, not in how intense the light was. So in other words, I can give more energy to the room by turning the volume up, by amplifying it more. So if you do that, wrong one, there. I didn't change the pitch though, did I? I increased the amplitude by making the, the speaker vibrate more. So what they didn't understand at first was, well, how what was happening with the light and Max Planck and Einstein were the ones that figured out you have pieces of light. And the more pieces of light you have at a certain frequency, the more total energy you have. But the light of the individual pieces of light or the energy of the individual pieces of light is based entirely on frequency. Um, and this frequency symbol, it's a Greek letter. It looks like a, a cursive V. Um, it's actually a Greek letter nu. Which means frequency in physics. Side note, does anybody play Scrabble with their family? Anybody? If you play Scrabble, Greek, word, Greek letters are actually a great way to play words in two directions at the same time. Two letter words or two letter words count in Scrabble, and there's a lot of Greek letters that are two letter words. Like pi, pi is a valid word in Scrabble. Um, 
you want to up your game, you have to start playing two words at the same time. I learned that early on when I joined my wife's family. All right. So what does this have to do with light? Kind of understand how it applies to waves. The whole idea of packets of energy doesn't really make any sense. What Einstein did was he showed, okay, it doesn't matter how loud I make the speaker. It only matters if I'm trying to get a certain thing to happen. It only matters what the frequency is. If you can't change the frequency, you're not really changing the energy of the light. Which was weird. They didn't really understand what was going on with that. Um, and then coupled this at the same time, Bohr is coming up with his what's called the Bohr model. How many of you have had chemistry before? So you've probably heard the Bohr model, right? Yeah. Bohr model was just was, you know, you've got your nucleus in the middle, right, with positive charge, and then you've got these shells around the outside, and the electrons have to be in the shells, right? Why it was so groundbreaking at the time was that Bohr was the one who who made the conclusion that the electrons can't exist in between those shells. You can think of those shells as being physical space. They are physical space, but it's 3D and they're three-dimensional functions with complicated shapes. But it doesn't really matter. If you just think about them in terms of energy, the further away you get from the nucleus, the more energy the electron has. Just like the further away from the surface of the Earth and a satellite gets, the more energy it has. But where it got weird was Bohr realized it couldn't be in between these two levels. A satellite, you can put at any altitude you want, right? You can, in theory, give, give a satellite as much energy as you want down to however many sig figs you want to measure it. An electron can only exist here or here, like the harmonics on the guitar string. If it can only exist here and here, then there's something weird going on because it basically means that the universe is pixelated at a small enough scale. They didn't even have that term. They didn't have TVs, so they didn't have... Does everybody know what I mean when I say pixelated? Like, if you zoom in enough on a screen, you can see the individual dots of light, right? Basically, what Bohr was showing is that electrons and reality itself are pixelated if you zoom in far enough, which, again doesn't make any sense, especially them because they didn't even have the word pixelated to describe it. And so the way that they did describe it is they described it as a series of bookshelves. And if you're trying to put electrons around a nucleus, you start by putting the books on the lowest energy shelf, which is the shelf closest to the ground. When that shelf is filled up, you put, you put electrons, books, on the second shelf. You can't really put a book halfway in between shelf one and two, right? If I'm putting a book on a bookshelf, it's either on the first shelf or the second shelf in this analogy. Obviously, you can, you know, you can only take that analogy so far because you can have books stacked on top of books and sideways and crammed in there or whatever. Um, so don't try to take that analogy too far. But it's the best way they had at the time to say, okay, as we're adding electrons into these increasing energy levels, we're going to start seeing, um, we're going to run out of space at the lowest energy and start um, filling in the next energy level, the next shelf. All right, so then... If electrons can exist on shelf one or shelf two, but not in between, how do you move electrons from point A to point B? Say it again. Charges. Charge, they're already charged, right? So charges are going to affect where they're sitting and their energies. That's definitely going to affect things. But let's just say I had an electron sitting here and I want to move it to this energy level. How do I do that? Add electrons. You can add electrons, just fill it up. <clears throat> Turns out you can actually use light to do that. Light's just a packet of energy, right, with a certain frequency. If there's a difference in energy between these two energy levels, 
if you can shine light of the right frequency on this, you can actually get that that electron to bump up into another energy level just by shining light on it. We call that promoting an electron or exciting an electron. When you excite an electron or you promote an electron, you shine a photon. And we usually represent a photon as H nu. We just, this represents a light wave coming in here. It's gonna hit that, that electron. If this light has the right energy that corresponds with this delta E, then you move an electron from a low energy level to a higher energy level and the photon disappears. When light is absorbed, that's what's happening. No, good question. Because now we have an energy, we have an, um, a book in a high energy, high shelf, but it's more stable if it's down lower level, right? So what will naturally happen is those electrons that are, that are excited will relax, meaning they fall back down and they generate the same photon when they do. This is why some things glow. You think about um, day glow shirts under a black light. What's happening is the UV light that's, that's higher energy than what our eyes can see is exciting an electron. When that electron falls back down, it's giving off energy that corresponds to whatever this delta E is between those energy levels. Right, that process is called fluorescence. It's also how LEDs work. Fluorescence works, and L LEDs work by basically using battery and electricity and voltage to move to promote an electron. And then when it falls back down, it generates a photon of a specific wavelength, of a specific frequency. Is that why light is no, you're, that's exactly right. Certain, certain materials have enough possible transitions that they can absorb a whole bunch of different wavelengths of light. And if they can absorb a whole, enough different wavelengths of light, it looks like there's no, there's no light passing through. No visible light is coming out the other side because it's all being absorbed on its way through. And if all of these energy levels are close enough to each other, if this delta E is small enough, when the electron relaxes back down to where it was, it does so in a bunch of tiny steps that, that looks like heat, basically. It's too small of an energy for it to show up in the visible wavelength or visible range. And so that's why if you have some a black shirt and you stand in the sun, it gets hot faster because it's absorbing all the wavelengths of light, promoting the electrons when it does so, and when they fall back down one tiny step at a time, that energy is all emitted as heat. And then, or go back in the back. Um, that's a little bit like asking what makes what makes something fall towards the ground. Like you can think about this marker as being a promoted electron. If I let go of it, what's going to happen? It's going to relax. So electrons relax because they're most stable close to the nucleus because electrons have what charge? Negative. What charge does the nucleus have? But so they're attracted to each other. So the electrons naturally want to fall towards the nucleus. We can temporarily promote them by shining light on them or by using the voltage, but they're going to relax back down. So what, not all light passes through glass. Almost all material has, has some of these different energy levels. It's just a matter of do those energy levels correspond with the visible spectrum that we can see. Some light passes through glass, or visible light passes through glass pretty well. Pretty much all wavelengths of visible light do. Not all infrared light does. And not all UV light passes through glass. It all has to do with how spaced out are those shelves you know and if if it happens to be that all the visible light can pass through because there's no transition that matches with the, the frequency of visible light then none of that those photons get absorbed but then the higher energy light so let's if we look for instance at this this graph here 
We have an electron being promoted. It's a bigger gap than the one right above it, right? If, if low energy light hits this material that has the big gap, there's nothing for, there's no electrons that it can promote because it doesn't have enough energy to promote the electrons. If it doesn't have enough energy to promote the electrons, the photon just continues on its way. If you shine high energy light, then when it hits there, it's going to have enough energy to promote the electron and the, and the energy gets absorbed. So it's all, and every material has its own set of energy levels. That's, go ahead. Exactly. exactly. And that's exactly what we're going to do in lab tomorrow. We're going to do flame tests, which I think last time, did we have them do the flame test or did you just demo it? We have them do it. Sweet. So the, the lab procedure says it's going to be just an instructor demonstration, and Tom's will show you how to do it. Um, but basically, you're going to start up the Bunsen burner, you're going to take a bunch of different um, metal atoms, metal ions. And basically hold them above the Bunsen burner to excite the electrons. When they fall back down, they give off different frequencies of light depending on what material they are, which we perceive as different colors. So how do mirrors reflect light on an atomic level? Um, with the right material, so they don't even even mirrors don't reflect all light. Perfectly. Some wavelengths of light move through the material, some wavelengths of light move back. There's a whole, when you get really into the specifics, there's a whole class of uh, vibrations called phonons, um, which is kind of is similar to the way that I was talking about how absorbed light can turn into heat. Um, there's some mechanisms where the absorbed light gets, gets bounced back the same direction with the same frequency or close to it. Um, and that's just a different type. It's not an electronic transition that's happening. It's more of a physical change that's happening. Um, that's a better question for your physics instructor. In theory, would it be possible to get the electron promoted so much that it isn't attracted to the nucleus anymore? That's exact. That's actually what Einstein demonstrated. So basically, Einstein demonstrated when he demonstrated that light was photons, um, he basically shined increasing frequencies of light on the on a metal until all of a sudden the metal became an ion he ionized the metal by shining light on it but you had to get above a certain frequency to do that but that's exactly what happened is you can think of if you have all of these different energy levels they all get closer and closer if you get enough energy to move an electron from here all the way out here it's no longer going to be stuck to that nucleus anymore and it flies off they call that wor the work function is the amount is the frequency of light required to promote an electron all the way from its lowest energy level up to mo removing it from the entire atom. And what happens to the electron once it gets outside of its own? You generate current. You generate electrons moving through material. This is similar to what's happening when you put a fork in the microwave. Is if you if you've ever done that, you shouldn't do that. You ruin your microwave that way. But you wind up basically exciting the electrons to the point where the cheap metal that's underneath the the coating of the fork winds up giving off electrons and it sparks. Is what you would actually see if you had that wired up to a current detector. You could actually see yourself generating current by using microwaves to excite electrons past that threshold. Josiah and then Mary. So remember, there is going to be a hard limit on how how fast the molecules can move, right? Because they're limited by the speed of light. Nothing can move faster than the speed of light. So there is a theoretical maximum for how hot something can get if the atoms start moving close to the speed of light. You can't heat it up past that, past the speed of light. Um, but and, and entropy is really its own thing. It's more statistics based. We're gonna we'll get to that when we talk about about equilibrium in in a couple weeks. Mary.
you can use the help box to create some problems. Like, I know it's really with light, and so that's something that you generally would want to use it, or if you go on like a video rather than. In theory, to the best of our knowledge, it seems like it's a good assumption that physics behaves the same everywhere in the universe. Like, if it's on like the air or something, like the, the gravity you have to react it, on it, or anything. It will affect. So that's where light and relativity gets weird. Yeah. The light still moves the same speed, but the but you can curve the surface of space time to make the light have to travel back farther. Yeah. And it, that means it can make it so that it takes longer for the light to get from point A to point B if you put Jupiter in the middle. Because it Jupiter pulls down the fabric of space time to the point that it's actually going to make the light physically travel farther to go to, from point A to point B, even though point A and point B seem like they're the same distance apart. The way to visualize, the way to visualize gravity in space time is think about a bed sheet pulled tight, and then you could roll, roll a ball, a marble across there, it's gonna go in a straight line from point A to point B. And it's gonna go a certain distance, let's say that that's 10 meters. If I put a bowling ball in the middle, that's going to stretch the sheet, right? Now the same marble, still going from point A to point B, actually has to go 11 meters. Even if it's going the same speed, like light would be, it would take longer for it to get to point A to point B. So gravity does mess with things. But it doesn't change the speed of light, it just changes the apparent speed of light to an observer. It might, you would have to take into it. Jupiter's probably not big enough to really make that big of a difference, but something like a large star would actually, we can they have what's or it causes what's called gravitational lensing, where you can actually focus light around a star. You can see what's behind the star um, without the light actually passing through the star. Picture rolling our marble around the bowling ball. It's going to still go in a straight line from point A to point B, but it has to go around the bowling ball to do so. And light can do the same thing. Um, and so it does get a little bit weird, but it's been a long time since I took relativity. Um, so I'm not going to go too much more in detail on the effects of gravity because gravity is where things get even weirder. Quantum is weird enough. If nothing is moving faster than the speed of light, then how is the universe expanding faster? Um, that's a good question. So the answer is so same similar analogy here. Picture points A and B, but on the surface of a balloon. They're a certain distance apart, and traveling from point A to B has a theoretical maximum of the speed of light. Well, what if I blow the balloon up more? Points A and B are no longer the same distance apart, are they? because the two points on the surface of the balloon are now further apart because the balloon itself expanded. So it's not really just that the universes or that the galaxies are expanding away from each other or flying away from each other. The universe and space itself is expanding, which is causing the galaxies to be further apart. And what's causing that, that's a whole, that's a whole thing called inflation, not related to economic inflation. Um, so they, they went with the balloon analogy with that. Um, but then there's also what's called dark energy, which is basically energy we don't know where it's coming from necessarily, but it's causing inflation and the expansion of the universe and the acceleration of these galaxies flying away from each other, um, even though we don't quite know why. So they just call it dark energy because we don't have an explanation. Universe that's where you get into a lot of arguments with cosmologists and physicists. Depends on who you ask. What is your thought? Um, it would make a lot of sense for it to be infinite. It would. You. It also makes the math work a whole lot more neatly if it's not infinite. So, I don't have a form a a good answer for that other than both sort of fit the evidence as we see it right now, and we don't have enough evidence to really decide one way or the other. If 
well, right now we can sort of define if, if the speed of light has a fixed speed and we're in one point in the universe, there's in the universe has a finite lifespan, lifetime, it's only existed for about 15 billion years, then light from the universe has only had 15 billion years to reach where we are right now from other galaxies, right? So with that in mind, the observable, what they call the observable universe is basically everything that's within 15 billion light years of us. Because if there's anything beyond that, light hasn't had a chance to reach us anyway. So there's no point in, and we can't really do anything with that because if light hasn't had time to reach us from further than 15 billion light years, because the universe is only 15 billion years old, then maybe there's something past that we'll ne we won't know until enough time has passed that more light can get to us from earlier in the, in the universe. But that's sort of some, that's sort of, um, answering the question with another question. I didn't really answer the question, right? because it just said that we, we have no way of knowing, but that's the best we can do right now. Can I see a hand over here too? No? All right. So all of this just to say the universe behaves in a kind of a weird random way. Um, and it's not the same way that we perceive things at our scale. You get to astronomical scale, things behave differently than us. If you get to the quantum scale, things behave differently than us. Because here's the other, the other funny part about this. We go back to the Bohr model and electrons jumping from one energy level to another. These electrons, it can exist at n equals two at the second energy level, or it can exist at n equals one at the first energy level. And it can't exist in between the two how does it get from point A to point B if it can't exist between point A and point B? Doesn't Bohr's level only work with hydrogen? I remember reading that. Somewhere. The calculations only work. It, okay. And it's a decent approximation. Well, we're going to add some tweaks to it to make it work better for multi-electronic systems. Does that? Would it be like, uh, like terms of Space, that, that's actually a pretty good way of thinking about it, except that it's instantaneous. So what happens, what our best explanation for it is that the electron ceases to exist here and it starts existing there. And it doesn't exist at all in between the two. In other words, the electron teleports. That's really, I. I hate to use you know sci-fi terms, but there's really not a better way to understand it. It stops existing here and it starts existing there. And no at no time does it exist between the two points. No. It's it seems like maybe we just don't have a fast enough camera to be able to capture it or something like that. But no, it the map bears that out, that it actually goes through what's called a creation operator and an annihilation operator. The electron stops existing one place and simultaneously begins existing at another place. <laughs> That's a good question. If you can't tell the difference between different electrons, then we can't really say for sure. Um, in fact, there's actually a quantum mechanical theory that says that that in the entire universe, only one electron exists. But it just exists everywhere simultaneously. A copy or like, it's not even a, a copy. It's basically if the electron is not bound by time, it can be here and then it can be here and then it can be here. It all perceived as being at the same time. But it's, it's, it turns out electrons are weird. Did I see a hand over here, Tim? Who else had a question? All right. So what does all this have to do with your pre-lab? We're going to, we're going to measure the energy that's given off by different elements when we heat them by looking at the color of light. Here's another really cool thing, another 
I'm not sure if you're ready to have your mind mind blown again of oh, this so soon, but let's try it. Um, color is just your brain's way of interpreting the wavelength of light, the energy of light. That's that's really all it is. Color is just you perceive a photon. Your brain wants to give it a certain value as far as how much energy does that photon have, which our in our brain creates this structure that we perceive as color. But all it really is is a way of measuring and estimating the frequency of light. Well, so that means like in a way, but they're all using the word blue to mean light yeah, with yeah, a yeah. certain wavelength. But yeah, yeah there's but they could be perceiving it totally different. Yeah. So perception is tricky, and other people's minds being having different physical structure means that yeah, they could perceive that's maybe that's why some people find the color red to be more aesthetically pleasing than other people. It might just be learned or cultural or something like that, but it also could be that it, their brain chemistry, their brain structure is a little different. Mary? Different, sorry. Yeah, I was going to say, yes. And that's where it gets really weird. So it's um, butterflies, certain species of butterflies actually see five primary colors. Five. They see a little bit wider of a range than we do. They see into the UV and we can't. But at the same time, even within what we consider the visible range, they have a fourth primary color that we don't even have a word to describe. Because our primary, all of our color wheel is made from mixing three primary colors, right? That's only, that's not the way the physical world behaves. That's the way that our brain and the number of cones in our eyes and the structure of our brain perceive wavelength. We're not, so when they say dogs are colorblind, they're red, green colorblind. They actually see one color plus black and white. That's, that's probably how a butterfly would think about the way we only perceive. So a dog has one primary color plus black and white, or maybe two primary colors plus black and white. We have three primary colors. We don't really have a way of describing what the dog sees. Just like a butterfly, we don't have a way of describing what a butterfly sees, other than we know based on the, the rods and cones, cones and rods, um, that they have the ability to see this. And we can do tests that show that they see things that we can't. Is there another question over here? Hey, does that mean that in the universe perspective, things could technically be black and white? For example, like the whiteboard, you're just spreading energy on a whiteboard and then our eyes are perceiving it as a color? We are spreading energy on the whiteboard in the form of the lights. White light shines on the whiteboard and then everything except for the blue wavelength gets reflected, gets absorbed. So physics actually uses a subtractive color model, not an additive color model, which means that it's not that this is blue so much as it absorbs everything that's not blue. Lila? So when you said that it was like a physics there's definitely science and they mix different dyes together if you take a black marker it's not actually one dye it's actually five or six dyes mixed together and the, all of those dyes together collectively absorb all of the wavelength of white light that we're shining on the board um, and we can actually do a lab where we actually take markers, different brands of markers, like Sharpie versus another permanent marker versus another permanent marker versus a black expo. We can actually separate out the different dyes that they use. And you can actually see that not it's actually proprietary to the brand. Sharpie's black is not the same black as Expo's black. Um, because that's that's something that they copyright and they guard that secret very, very carefully. What the, what makes yeah exactly. Sorry, sorry. Was there another question over here? I pointed over here because I thought there was a hand. But. Do you like 
So, yes, is the short answer. Um, the, the long answer is that that's actually what evolution does. The reason we see three primary colors and we perceive the visible spectrum the way we do is because it was an advantage evolutionarily. At some point, it became an advantage to be able to tell one color from another color, one wavelength of light from another wavelength of light. And who's to say exactly why that was, but the earliest forms of life that had something like an eye, basically it was just all it detected was photon, no photon. It was basically like on off. And it was a single celled organism. I believe it was a paramecium um, ancestor um, that had this light sensitive organelle inside it that all it did was help that paramecium move closer to the light so that it could photosynthesize better. It really wasn't an advantage yet for it to be able to tell green from blue. So it didn't have that ability. But then over time, you know, millions and millions and millions of years, as competition became greater, it became for some species, it became an advantage for them to see different colors of light more than others. For butterflies, it's so that they can actually see what uh, specific species of flowers, certain species of flowers are colored in a way that, that the butterflies can see that we can't. It's because it was an advantage for the butterflies to find those species of flowers so that they could eat more and reproduce. It's never in the history of humans been an advantage for us to be able to see that color UV. So why would we ever develop that ability naturally? That's not to say it couldn't happen artificially, which is what you're talking about. Well, um, so does that mean that the colors of the butterflies can see that we can't? Is that like just a color you can't see, period? Or is that just a color you think of as two primary colors combined? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, we, so it's, have, do you know anybody in your life that's red, green, colorblind? <laughs> so, I mean, how, how do you explain to somebody who's red, green, colorblind the difference between different shades of green if they can't see them? You can no. say that they're different, <laughs> and he just takes, has to take yeah. us at our word for it, right? The butterfly can tell us that they're different. We can't describe how they're different because it's a butterfly. Um, but there's, there's really not a single answer for that. It's really something that our brain's not set up to comprehend all that well. So it's just a shade between two colors that you can't like tell the difference. Yes, that's probably the way we would perceive it, yeah. Okay. Now in technicality, would it be possible to see what type of colors make a specific color? Like for example, if the lime green shade down there, for us it's a mix of like green and yellow, but in reality for like other things, it's like a mix of red, blue, brown, green. Or is maybe for the butterfly, it? this is the other primary color. But would there be a way to see? how much colors would go to make an anatomy? We can estimate it by looking at the anatomy of the creature's eyes and their brain. Based on how many cones they have in their eyes, we can, the, the color or the number and the, and the shape of the cone structures, cone cells in a creature's eye, will give us, in, gives us insight as to how well they can differentiate between colors which then we can work backwards and analyze and come up with this. They see enough shades. It's really four colors, four primary colors. Yep. All right. How does this affect you tomorrow? Besides, not you're not going to be able to sleep tonight because you're going to be thinking about color. And... <laughs> the last, the only other equation you need for tomorrow. So just a sec, just at one second. I know it's close. What is lowercase c in uh, in physics or chemistry? That's a variable. Color. Now speed of light. Oh, like e equals mc squared. For light, if some for a particle that or a wave that's traveling at the speed of light, the frequency of that light times the wavelength of that light. This is the Greek letter lambda. Lambda, L-A-M-D-A. So that's wavelength. 
and wavelength we can measure just as an actual distance. So wavelength, literally, if you have a wave like this, wavelength is the distance between two peaks measured in, in meters, or in case light, nanometers. If you know lambda, because you can perceive the color, you can calculate frequency. Frequencies in weird units. The reason we measure things in, in wavelength is because we can think about a distance and it makes sense to us. Frequencies in units of hertz or cycles per second. Basically, frequencies, if you stood right here and you let the wave pass by you, how many peaks do you see in one second? So that's a little harder to wrap your head around. So that's why we don't measure light in frequency as often as in wavelength. So you're going to start in wavelength. And knowing that C is a constant, you can get frequency. If you know frequency, you can get the energy of that light. Yes. Simple algebra, right? It's easy math. It's just weird concepts. All right. Good job today. I'll see everybody on Friday. This is a bunch of vendor parts that I've put together. This is it's a called a vendor bullet from the Indies. The hit card is actually in the oh, It is, yeah. It's, kind of, so it's just a bunch of spare parts I found on the But it's uh, it's all set up to play play doom metal. So um, this is all the guitars. This is a guitar I built. Yeah, I think this this actually was my very first guitar when I was in high school. I bought a Squire, but I fixed the neck up, and then it was nice. And the rest of it is all rewired. And... Oh, thank you. It's fun. Oh, I will not give you a friend. Okay. So we're gonna start saying, looking at how does all of this actually? How can we apply this? Because I can't test you on any of this stuff, right? The way it is. So we're going to start like, okay, well, how do the electrons behave around atoms more specifically? Um, but I'll post the slides. I'll post the video so you'll have the audio to go along with the slides. And um, and any other questions you have about the quiz, ask it on the quiz this weekend or on Monday when, when you come back. Okay, okay, sounds good. Thank you. No problem. See you, Parker. Yeah, let me, let me hit stop on the uh, recording.